you ask the question, what are some of the easiest ways that you can prove that the Earth is round? Because apparently this is something that we're debating. I, I have no idea why. It, that's a hard thing for me to even start talking about because there are so many proofs that the Earth is round, it's difficult to know where to start. And it's not okay to think that the Earth is flat. This is not a viable argument. To begin with, if you truly believe the Earth to be a triangle or a dodecahedron, that is most certainly okay and your right to do so. We all have the right to our own thoughts, beliefs, experience, intuitions, and discernment, regardless of how common or widely accepted they are. Telling people up front that having an alternative perspective from yours is, quote, not okay, is incredibly narcissistic, abusive, and an attempt to infantilize the listener into accepting the fallacy of appeal to authority. It is absolutely okay to question the shape of the earth. In fact, the scientific method itself requires constant questioning and experimentation to reach increasingly precise conclusions. Once a scientific postulate becomes solidified into an unquestionable dogma, it becomes religion, not science. And people demanding your allegiance to their dogma, like Michelle here, are acting far more like evangelical priests than true scientists. NASA themselves have already changed the alleged shape of the Earth thrice in their short history, first telling us we lived on a perfect sphere, then changing the shape into an oblate spheroid flattened at the poles, then changing again to a pear-shaped spheroid bulging out in the southern hemisphere. Um, I have friends who have been on the International Space Station. They have orbited the Earth once every 90 minutes. You know, I've had personal experience with people that have been up in space and can see with their own eyes that the Earth is round. And of course, we've taken all these amazing pictures from space. They're, they're so beautiful, all those pictures of the Earth. So I don't really know what's going on right now with this Earth is flat thing. Here, Michelle condescendingly delivers two more examples of sophistry, namely hearsay and another appeal to authority because she has some fellow Freemason Eastern Star actor not friends who claim the Earth is a spinning ball, Michelle wants us to accept that kind of second-hand hearsay as scientific proof. Then she laughs and talks about pictures. Pictures like these, you mean? And these? Michelle was directly asked for scientific proofs of her claim, and the first two she gives are because other people say so, and because there's pictures. Well, Michelle, I know you already know this, but people can lie. Pictures can be faked, and neither of those are permissible as scientific evidence. So why are you dancing around the question with sophistry and condescension instead of just providing actual proof of your claim? There are proofs all around you. It is not difficult to know that the Earth is round. In fact, people have known this for way more than 2,000 years. The ancient Greeks actually had a number of really elegant, wonderful proofs that the Earth was a sphere. One of the things you can see yourself with a pair of binoculars is if you actually go out to a lake and there are boats on that lake, the farther away a boat is, the more the bottom of the boat will disappear and you'll basically just see the mast of the boat. And as a boat goes farther and farther away, the last thing you will see is the very top of the mast of that boat. And that's because the boat is actually going over the horizon that's curved. So once she finally gets around to her three supposed scientific proofs of a ball earth, they are all from ancient Greek astronomers who have been debunked since the time they were presented even way back then. Her first is the dinosaur claim that ships disappearing beyond the horizon hull first somehow prove the Earth to be a globe. The fact of the matter is that the law of perspective on plane surfaces dictates and necessitates this occurrence. For example, a girl wearing a dress walking away towards the horizon will appear to sink into the Earth the farther away she walks. Her feet will disappear from view first, and the distance between the ground and the bottom of her dress will gradually diminish until after about half a mile, it seems like her dress is touching the ground as she walks on invisible legs. The same happens with cars speeding away. The axles gradually get lower, and the wheels vanish until it appears as if the car is gliding along its body. Such is the case on plane surfaces. The lowest parts of objects receding from a given point of observation necessarily disappear before the highest. Now, with modern telescopes and cameras, we can prove this as well by successfully zooming in on ships that have gone beyond the horizon and bringing them completely back into full view, hull and all. Now, another way that you can tell that we're on a sphere 
is to think about how there's something called the tropics on the Earth. And the tropics are places near the equator of the Earth where sometimes the sun is overhead in the sky. And this was actually something that the Greeks used not only to prove that the Earth was round about 2,000 years ago, but they actually measured the circumference of the Earth accurate to within just a couple percent. There was a really brilliant Greek scientist called Aristosthenes. And Aristosthenes noticed that there was a town called Syene. And on a certain date, the sun would actually shine straight down to the bottom of a well. That meant the sun was directly overhead. You could look down a well and see the sun shining back at you. And on the very same date, farther away in the city of Alexandria, that didn't happen. The sun was not directly overhead. It was a slight angle. And all that Aristosthenes did was he measured the difference in the angle of the sun. And he rationed that that change in angle from one city to another was probably indicative of us being on a curved surface. So another really simple proof is that on any given date, at different cities and different places around the world, the sun is at different angles in the sky. That wouldn't happen if the Earth wasn't round. For her second supposed proof, Michelle tells the story of Eratosthenes, who noted that at noon during the summer solstice in Seine, the sun cast no shadow and the rays could reach straight to the bottom of his well. Yet meanwhile, in Alexandria, a vertically standing metal rod cast a significant shadow. By factoring the length of the shadow with his assumed distance to the sun, Eratosthenes recorded a measurement of Earth's circumference close to what heliocentrist astronomers still use today. The fact of the matter is, however, that Eratosthenes' calculations were made assuming the sun to be millions of miles away, so that its rays would fall perfectly parallel even in points as divergent as Cyan and Alexandria. This faulty assumed premise led to his faulty conclusion, which was eventually exposed upon the invention of the nautical sextant. Using sextants and plane trigonometry, by measuring the sun's angle at two points on Earth simultaneously and factoring their distance from each other, the Pythagorean theorem reveals both the height and dimensions of the sun. Using this method, the sun and moon have repeatedly been calculated to be approximately 32 miles in diameter, 3,000 miles from the surface of the Earth. High-altitude balloon footage has also filmed lighting hotspots on clouds proving the sun to be local and acting as a spotlight, and not a burning ball of gas millions of miles away as supposed by heliocentrists. After Eratosthenes, the globe-earth theory completely disappeared from philosophical thought and recorded history for almost two millennia. Geocentric flat-earth cosmologies continued to reign supreme, with even Eratosthenes himself touted as the father of geography, depicting the Earth as flat in his famous 194 BC map of the world. Then there are some other proofs that are a little more obscure, but they're actually really lovely. And one is to observe what happens during a lunar eclipse. Now, a lunar eclipse happens when the Earth casts a shadow on the moon. What's happening in that case is that the sun is on one side of the Earth. The Earth is in the middle, and it's casting a shadow. The Earth is casting a shadow on the moon. And as the shadow moves across the moon, you'll notice that the shadow is curved, it's round. So something like the sun that's bigger than the Earth and is able to cast a shadow of the Earth on the moon can actually show you the shape of the Earth. Her final and most ridiculous supposed proof of the shape of the Earth beneath our feet is accomplished by looking at a light in the sky. That's right. When you ask scientists for empirical, measurable proof of the shape of the Earth beneath our feet, they invariably, inevitably, turn their noses up to the sky and start talking about the shape of things up there. Imagine inviting a contractor over to your house to measure the dimensions of your floor, and he immediately gets out his tape measure and starts measuring all the recessed lights in the ceiling. To this day, heliocentrists still offer this argument as proof of a spherical Earth, claiming that during lunar eclipses, the sun, earth, and moon align in a perfect 180-degree syzygy like three billiard balls, causing the sun to cast the earth's shadow onto the moon. This clever but faulty assumption is rendered completely invalid, however, due to the fact that lunar eclipses have happened and continue to happen regularly when both the sun and moon are still visible together above the horizon. As early as the time of Pliny the Elder, there are records of eclipses happening while both the sun and moon were visible in the sky, and continue to be recorded by the Royal Astronomical Society today. Obviously, if the sun and moon are both observable simultaneously during an eclipse, then they are not aligned in a 180-degree syzygy, and it is therefore impossible that the sun could be casting Earth's shadow on the moon. 
and some other explanation must be sought. Another explanation, in fact, already existed in many cultures around the world, who posited that a third celestial body, known as Rahu, or the Black Sun, also existed, equal in size to the Sun and Moon. This translucent dark body passed afront the Sun and Moon during eclipses, causing their lights to dim. But regardless of what causes the Moon's lights to dim during lunar eclipses, it has absolutely nothing to do with offering scientific proof of the shape of the Earth. So people have known that the Earth is spherical for thousands of years. It's not okay to say that the Earth is flat. This is some sort of strange denial. I don't know where it comes from. And it's something where I keep getting this question. We really need to put this question to bed because we've known the Earth is a sphere for a long time. I actually said this to somebody, I couldn't believe they'd never thought of it, that you know, with binoculars you can see planets, you can see Saturn and Jupiter, you can, you can see Mars with a telescope, the sun, the moon, everything else you see in the solar system is a sphere. So we're, we're the one thing that is different. You know, and and that, actually, that actually made somebody who was, who was more interested in actually hearing information, that actually got them to think, they were like, you're right, you know, you know, everything else we take a picture of is a sphere. And again with the appeal to the sky fallacy. The only place we see spheres in the sky is NASA's CGI photos and videos. When amateur astronomers photograph and record the stars and planets, here is what we see. Are these spheres? Are these spheres? And even if they were spheres, what on earth does that have to do with the shape of the earth?